I always think it's funny with the whoops and applauses. You have no idea whether this is going to be applause worthy or not. But I appreciate, I appreciate your willingness to clap beforehand. My one brief claim to stardom is I have a few people clap for me. Don't you wish you had people just kind of following you around that would break out in applause <laughs> once in a while? Well, it's good to have you this morning, Phil and Mel are traveling, and um, lots of good things are happening around the world. Lots of bad things, too. I don't know when the last time you were in a fight. When was the last time you were in a fight? <laughs> Man, when I was born, this, this was told to me much later, and I was glad for it. My, my grandmother, or my mother said, she has dementia. This is probably why it came out. I was a big baby, and they had to, like, break my collarbone during my birth, and when my grandpa and my grandma came to see me in the hospital, my mom said, my grandpa, my grandma's name was Lena. He said, my Lord, Lena, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. So I think I had to, yeah, you could applaud. <laughs> You're applauding my grandfather. Thank you. You know, and I, I think I've shared over the years with you guys, my dad took off when I was young. I was a mama's boy. I was, I was growing up in Kentucky. I was big, and I got beat on by everybody. I was, a, I was not a fighter. I did not know how to fight at all, but I kept getting in fights because I think all the smaller people thought, okay, I can take this guy, you know. <laughs> and then my mom remarried, and she married somebody who came from a very broken family, who struggled with alcohol, who was physically abusive. He was not uh, the nicest man. And um, I did learn to run, though. And so there were a few times <laughs> where I would yell something at somebody and then run, like run home. And if I could just make it to the screen door and lock it, like then I would taunt from inside. Like I would taunt whoever was, ran after me. And one time I'm taunting Thomas, who was the neighborhood bully, and suddenly he got like real scared and ran off, and my stepdad was behind me. Now, my stepdad was a small man, and he had, you know, that Napoleon complex, that small man complex. I would go into bars. He, he would take me to bars to shoot pool, and um, I've seen him go up against much bigger guys. He was a small dude, but he was terribly intimidating, like you wouldn't mess with him. And he happened to ask me what, what was going on there, and I said, well, he wanted to beat me up, and, and so he said, well, here's what's going to happen. You're going to call Thomas, you're going to tell him where you're going to be, and you're going to fight him. And then he took me into the backyard, and he says, here's what you're going to do. If you're going to be dumb enough to fight, there are no rules. You're going to bite, you're going to claw, you're going to scrape, you're going to gouge for the eyes, you're going to do whatever it takes, but you don't come home until you've won. And I went, and I beat Thomas up. <laughs> and I came home and was grounded and couldn't leave my room for two days for being so stupid to get into a fight. Right? I didn't have many fights after that. I had a few. There were a few people I, I needed to fight, and I made sure I fought them. But, but I'm glad I'm kind of past that, you know? I'm glad I don't walk around looking to fight. But for those of you who are younger, who you've been in fights, man, life is a fight. We may not physically be, be in fights, but life is hard. Life is a fight. It may not be a physical person, but you're going to fight against so many things. You're going to fight against yourself. That's going to be a lifelong fight just against yourself. You're going to fight with others in your mind. Even if you never have those conversations, you'll have them. That person may not hear what you're saying, but you're going to relive things over and over and over again. You're going to fight even as you try to do good things, you know, one of the things as a missionary when I would begin to study the Bible with people, let's say I started 10 Bible studies. I learned very quickly about seven of them within the first four weeks would drop out. But they would drop out because if they didn't have a job, suddenly they have a job, which is a good thing, but they don't have time. Or they had a job and they suddenly lose it. Or they get very ill, or somebody in their family died. It happened over and over, and I began to see 
there is an invisible fight going on. I even had one family show up and they said, you cannot study with my daughter because since she started studying with you, everything is going wrong. You know, There's invisible fights that we are not even aware of. I don't know what you're fighting with, if it's debt, if it's disillusionment, if your life is not what you thought it would be, if your marriage is not what you thought it would be, if your church is not what you thought it would be, if you are not the person you want to be, welcome to the club. <laughs> because this world is full of fighting. And yet it's not all bad. God shows up. God, it's not just a world of, of chaos and fighting. It's also a world where amazing things happen. And you've experienced some amazing things. The fact that you are seated here today is an amazing thing. 35s and unders don't get church very much anymore. They're not that interested in church, the typical church service. Uh, my kids sometimes refer to it. My kids, I'm a missionary, church planter. I've started churches all over. My kids call it the show, you know, or I've heard that a couple times. They're not interested in the show, you know. I grew up in a time where you sat in hard pews, wooden pews with a pipe organ, and you sang old, you know, old songs I didn't care about, and I remember sitting there and just counting the pipes on the pipe organ every Sunday. How many pipes? Because I'd always get up to like 70. It was a big church, and I'd, I'd lose count. I'd have to start over. I think there were 72. So when the new music came in, and you have drums, and you have, I loved it. Like, I still love it. I like all of that, you know. But younger people aren't as impressed with that. You guys have been sold everything. Like, everything is being sold to you. And so, to have a spiritual experience, you're probably not all that impressed with the bells and the whistles and the lights and the, you know. So there's something going on this, this week that many of you have heard about at Asbury Seminary. There's this revival taking place, and Phil and, and Jana and I and Alex and Aaron went, and then Bonnie went. I don't know if anybody else went. Uh, I'd always read about revivals. Never been to one. I wasn't even sure why I was going other than this is important if something's going on there. And if you actually go to Asbury's uh, chapel series, here's what happened after chapel. They have chapel a few times a week. After chapel, people didn't leave. Now, they're all young college kids, right? They started to pray in little groups. Nobody organized this. If you actually listen to the sermon, <laughs> it was a nice sermon. There was nothing, though, to prepare anybody for what would happen. Students began to cry. Students began to sing. Some began to pray. And it went all day long. And then the next day, all day long. And then more students came, and then the staff came, and then the whole town started to come. By the time we went one week later, the guy who works there said, oh yeah, people who are here now don't even live within 50 miles of this place. They're coming from all over the world. They're flying in. And you went into this old chapel in their wooden seats that, that pull down. It's an old building. There's no projection of anything. And somebody stood up and they kind of gave some ground rules. And they said, look, we have no idea what we're doing. We didn't do this. We, we don't know other than God is doing something here. And when we went in and it fills up with, let's say, 1,200 people, I don't know how many can fit in, there's still a line of thousands of people waiting to come in. So what was I expecting? It was remarkable because it was entirely unremarkable. They had no special speakers. They had no band, really. They had some, a music person would come up, sit at the piano, start to play, and sing. They didn't project the lyrics. I didn't know all the songs. And for like 40 minutes to an hour, people just sang. And then they asked people if they had scripture to share, and some people shared scripture. And then they sang for another hour, and then they had people come up. If God has done something in your life in, in the last you know, few months, not a long time ago, come up, be very short. And people came up, 
and people were talking just about what God has done, and then they would start to pray that it would happen in other people's lives. It was just this amazing thing. But if you were to tell me, Pat, if you were to say, hey, Chris, would you want to come to, to church and sit for six hours? We're going to sing and pray together. My inward answer would be, yeah, no thanks. Like, I'm not interested in that. Um, but there was something special there. Like, God is doing something special there. People are coming from all over the world now. And there was nothing spectacular happening. There was no leader. Lots of leaders have come. Lots of pastors have come. But they don't get ushered to the front. Everybody's in the, the same playing field. And I just, I just start, I think about this. I think of what was it about that? The fact is, God chose Asbury for some reason. We all know God is everywhere, right? God is everywhere. But there are times he chooses to be especially there. There are those moments where God shows up, those mountaintop experiences. And for whatever reason, he chose to show up in that place to work in that way and to remind all of us that he is real, that he is there. Because in a, living a life in a fallen world, we need those reminders. Like, we need to know that. We need to know in the midst of our struggles that God is real and that he's present. I want to share with you from 1 Samuel 14. You can look it up in your Bibles if you want. It's a, it's a story, and we're just going to walk through the story. And, and I just want you to think about this. There are times in our life where God is very real. There are times in our life where God shows up unannounced. We didn't expect it. We didn't do anything. And God shows up in an amazing way. There are other times, though, where we cry out to God. This fall was very difficult for my wife and I. A situation at work was going on, and we work with young people. And I literally was, was having, for the first time in my life, I didn't know what they were. I still hate saying it because I'm like, I'm not that weak of a person. Panic attacks. I was having these things where I'm laying in bed and my whole face is on fire in my arms and I don't know what's happening. Or Nisha would look over as we're driving to work and I'm going, <sighs> she says, what are you doing? I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and then we look it up on the internet and it's like this, 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 this. you're having panic attacks. I've seen God do all kinds of things. I'm 56 year old. Why am I having a panic attack? It's that things were going so wrong at work and I couldn't figure it out. I was in a hotel in Nashville and I get a call. Uh, I can't remember who it was. It wasn't Alex or Aaron, I don't think. But about something. And I remember just in the hotel room crying out to God, I have no idea. Like, God, please, you have to do something. Like, you have to do this. I can't, I can't manage this anymore. And guess what? Within 24 hours, it was managed. When you cry out to God, when you draw near to God, he draws near to you. And so there are times where God just shows up. There are times where he shows up because you showed up. But man, there's a lot of times where God's trusting you to trust him as you walk. So, in 1 Samuel 14, here's what we have. Here's the situation. You have King Saul who's fighting against the Philistines. And if you were at our, our month of prayer, this is the start of a devotional I shared there. King Saul is with his son Jonathan and his warriors, and they're fighting the Philistines, and it's going very badly. This was about 3,000 years ago. Samuel, the prophet, had already been informed by God, Saul is no longer, <laughs> he does not have God's blessing anymore. He, is, he has been rejected by God. And this is what we read. One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, so, so they're out in the fields, right? Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side, but he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts, outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migrom. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod, ephod he was a son of Ichabod's brother, Atub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach, the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozaz and the other Senna. 
So the situation, Saul with his soldiers is fighting for Israel against the Philistines. The problem is Saul had already been rejected by God. The problem is Saul, instead of being out on the battlefield or in prayer, he's seated under a tree. He's just sitting there. And it even says that there were religious leaders there. There were religious leaders there. But he is just sitting there. He is not exercising smart leadership, smart strategy. And in those times, the enemies had, it says, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 cavalry, and troops like the sand. Saul started with 3,000 men. He now only has 600. Some have died. Many have fled. It also says this, because... They, they, were not, they had not been allowed blacksmiths in Israel. They had to actually go to the Philistines previously to get their weapons. And it says the only people with swords were Saul and his son Jonathan. Those were the only two swords, the text says. They were hiding in caves. Some of their allies had deserted to the enemy's side. And they're just sitting there. And as I was up at, at this Asbury revival, I I was questioning, why am I going? What am I doing here? I'm not really sure. But as I sat there, there was just something different. There was nothing supernatural that you could see, but I was overcome with emotion, and God revealed what I needed. You know, he revealed what I needed. And we were there for several hours, and it was just an amazing experience. But sometimes, if, if you talk about Saul, a king, being in battle, Every one of us is in some type of battle right now. I mean, I talked about it earlier. I I don't know what you have come with. Your battle, like I said, may be with yourself. Your battle may be with your doubts. Your battle may be an addiction. Your battle may be children that you, you don't have the relationship you want to have. It may be an unhappy marriage or debt. I mean... Think of all the battles. You know, there's an artist that I would love to show the video sometime. You can only show some of it. She's a, she's a, she does a lot of crazy art. But she, she, she did a show in New York City called The Artist is Present. She has long black hair, very pale. And she's at, I don't know if it's the Met, I don't know, the huge art gallery there. And um, it's just a white room with a white table and two chairs. And she wears this long, I don't know if it's a red or a black or a white, I can't remember now, dress. And if you watch this video clip I have, here's the art show. She sits down, and one by one, people are let in to sit in the chair. And for one minute, she just stares at you. It went on for 15 days with lines around the block. In the video, people break down and start crying. If you watch this video, she does a lot of art that is not appropriate, right? But what's impactful is people are so dying to be seen and to be heard. They're willing to stand in line to have one person just look. And she does have this aura about her, you know. She just looks, and they break down. Man, all of you are in a battle. I mean, we're reading about King Saul today. (laughs) He's just seated under that tree. So much of my life, I feel like I've been a spectator. I'm just sitting under the tree. Life is what happens. Sometimes I'll go out and try to make something happen. (laughs) Sometimes I'll cry out to God and he shows up. But man, I can criticize Saul all day, but A lot of my life, I'm just sitting under the tree. And let me tell you, this is something remarkable. As I'm sitting in line, I'm with Alex. And if you don't know Alex's story, he has his story to share. But but he grew up on on the streets in a lot of ways with gangs. Uh, There was another guy in front who's a pastor, who ex-gang member. And then there was this guy, a hippie artist. He's probably in his 60s. But, man, he was excited, and he was there. And I was just looking at them. I grew up in a middle-class family. Like, we had our issues but I, I've been middle class. If you're middle class and up, we do okay. Like, we're not driven to cry out to God unless there's like an emergency. I have the work emergency, so suddenly I'm like, oh, God, help me. I don't know what to do. But, man, there is a reason why 
the Bible talks about how difficult it is for the rich. And you may say, well, I'm not rich. If you're middle class and up, compared to the rest of the world, you're very rich. All right. The fact is, those of us, it doesn't mean we don't have problems either. We have the normal problems of the world, sickness and job problems and other things. But man, we are not driven to God. But I'm looking at these guys and I'm like, man, they have stories where they, man, they had, they were, they had to trust in God. And I want to tell you today, you don't have to just live your life seated under the tree in the midst of the battles you're facing. So let's go on. What do we see about Jonathan? Jonathan, Saul's son, the king's son, he doesn't have to do anything. He's the king's son. He has position and status. If he were to risk himself to go into battle by himself as the king's son, it is not wise. Other soldiers might want to do that in bravery. The king's son probably shouldn't. He says he had to pass through a, a pass that had cliffs. One of the cliffs names Bozes means slippery cliff. The other one means thorny. They're descriptions of what, what those cliffs are. Now, think about what God could have done. God could have shown up and blown the Philistines to pieces. He could have, he could have given Jonathan a vision. Jonathan, an angel could have appeared to Jonathan. Jonathan, if you will trust the Lord and, and follow his commands, and you and your armor bear go against the entire Philistine army, he will deliver you. That's a lot of the stories we read in Scripture, where an angel appears and he gives instructions but we're not told that any of that happened. But Jonathan has this crazy idea. He says to his armor bearer, he doesn't carry his own sword and shield. He has a guy do it for him. Usually a younger person, a young kid. He says, let's go over to the Philistines. And that's, that's what we're reading. He's not content to just sit under a tree. And so... So get this, we're talked about there are times when God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, didn't require anything from us, right? There are times, though, where God challenges us with something, and we stand up and say, okay, we're going to do this. There are times, though, when we don't hear from God, but we want to do something, and we stand up, and we step out in the name of God. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it ad ends very badly. So verse 6, it says this, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. All right? That's, a, that's, a, that's him calling them a name, basically. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Here we see the heart and courage of Jonathan. Jonathan knew his dad was not measuring up. Jonathan knew they did not have the soldiers and weapons and supplies. Jonathan knew there was a lack of faithfulness among the Israelites. Jonathan knew the strength of the enemy. But Jonathan had a vision of what could be. I don't know about you. There's lots of things as church and church leaders that we come together to try to decide. And sometimes it's very clear from God. This is a direction. This is something we need to do. But most of the time, that's not what happens. Just so you know, when our leaders meet, we talk about what should we do, pray about what can we do. We don't have it all figured out. But I would much rather be part of a church that doesn't want to just sit under a tree and just exist. I want to be a community that's willing to stand up and have a vision. And if God declares to us this is the vision, then no question. As leaders, we need to follow it. If we feel like God has given us a vision, then we need to follow it. But we don't talk much about Jonathan's vision. Jonathan didn't. All he says is, perhaps. I don't know about you. It's, it wouldn't it be much better if he said, like Paul, I can do all things through Christ, you know, or I am more than a conqueror. You know, shouldn't have he have said, God is with us, who can be against us? We are going out, you know. That's not what he said. He's like, perhaps. Let's give it a shot. Because one thing I do know is, whether there's a lot of people or a few people, God can save. Like, he can do that. 
And I just think, as a leader, we, can, we, we should pray to God. We should be open to his leading. But man, there are times in life where you're going to ask God for direction and he's not going to give it to you. When I decided, God, I want to be a missionary, you know, where do I go? I prayed, I prayed, nothing. I read a book about Ecuador, five missionaries who were killed in the jungles. I didn't know where Ecuador was, and I said to God, God, I'm going to Ecuador. If this is not what you want me to do, then stop me. And he didn't stop me. I never heard God say go to Ecuador. But I didn't take that as just sit under the tree. Like, God, I want to step out in faith. When it was time to leave Ecuador... We looked at Spain, and it was the same thing. I didn't hear God. I prayed about it. I just said, God, I'm going to Spain. If you don't want me to go, then stop me. He didn't stop me. And then it was England. I resigned as our leader in Spain. We would started the school in England. We're going to move, and I said the same prayer. God, if you don't want me to go, then stop me. And suddenly he stopped me. And we find ourselves in the U.S. Sometimes we just act in faith. And I think God loves that. I think God, there's something about seeing his children step out in faith in his name when they don't even know, you know, without God having to say something. I think there's something special. So Jonathan had a vision, and there was even a willingness to step out in faith without a clear sign, you know, perhaps. Perhaps. There are things, you know, there's a, the, there's a verse in 1 John 5 that says, if you ask according to his will. You know, so sometimes we ask God for things according to his will. There are things we know what his will is. He doesn't desire that any perish. So when I pray for a lost person, I don't have to say, well, if it's your will. No. I know God wants this person to know him. Right? But there are other things. The job. I don't know if he wants me to have this job. And so I asked for wisdom or I asked for something to happen, you know. So there's a willingness to step out in faith even without a sign. And then when he did that, look in verse 7 how his armor bearer replied, Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you heart and soul. I am with you heart and soul. It inspires others. There's a, there's a saying in Spanish, dime con quien andas y te diré como eres. Tell me who you hang out with and I'll tell you what you're like. The reason we are in community, the reason why I'm in community is because I need you. Because a lot of the other people who are in my life that are not in community, they're not going to be very helpful for me when it comes to spiritual matters. I know what I'm going to get. I, you know, spent some time with family this week you know, that are not living out their faith. And when they heard I was at Asbury, they cackled and laughed. You know, you were with those kooks, you know. They didn't say that, but they pretty much said that, you know. And then I explained. But it, I need you. I need people when I don't have faith, who have faith, to say, come on, Chris, let's go. Like, I need you. Community should not be a place where you just show up on a Sunday. That's why we say, man, get involved in a small group. We're seeing more younger people. You guys need to not just, I think it's great you're here. We as a church now are saying we need to have something where we can meet with you and you guys can meet together and talk about what does God mean to you? What does the Bible mean to you? Where is God in your lives? You know. And so it inspires other people when we step out in faith. Now we go on in the story, and it says this, verse 8. Jonathan said, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. So that they're going to cross over. So they're going through this ravine on these two cliffs, and at the top of one of the cliffs is an outpost, you know, with Philistine soldiers. And he says, if they say to us, wait there until we come down to you, we will stay where we are and will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. I think as a child as well, we had a hill in the backyard of my house that the neighborhood kids would come and we played king of the hill. Does anybody remember the king of the hill? Yeah, I don't think anybody knows what that is anymore. 
Basically, one person stands at the top, everybody else tries to rush to the top, and if you're at the top, you're throwing them back down. You know, you're throwing it until they throw you down, you're the king of the hill, right? That was the great game. Fun game to play. But if there's two of you as soldiers and only one of you has a sword, and the, you know, the enemy's at the top of the hill, you don't want to be playing king of the hill. You want to say, come down here. Look at the craziness of Jonathan. Not only does he say to his armor bearer, instead of saying, God is with us, he is greater than us, you know, these are dogs, he, you know, he says, eh, you know, I don't think he probably did it that way. I think he's like, perhaps God will save us. You know, let's go. And then he says, here's how we'll know if God's with us. He should have said, if they're stupid enough to leave the higher ground and walk all the way down here, we'll know God is with us. That's not the fleece he put before God. That's not the test. He said, if they save, they're coming down to fight us. Mm -mm, we're not going to do it. But if they say, come up and fight us, we'll know God is with us. Again, maybe Jonathan just has you know, some learning difficulties. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe, you know, I, I just think that's just crazy. Haven't you done enough already? Like, haven't you done enough? You stepped out in faith, but that's what he does. Jonathan stepping out of faith continued. And then in verse 11, so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they are hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come on up and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. And then listen to what it says. Jonathan climbed up using what? His hands and his feet. We're not talking like king of the hill in my backyard with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. It may be a hard path, even when it's the right path. We've said, and, and there was debate about this, we said we're going to two services at Easter, because it's harder and harder to find places to sit, which is a good thing, right? We used to be at two services before, before COVID, right? And to be honest with you, we need more musicians, we need more tech people, we need more Sunday school teachers to make that a possibility. Because we can't have the, the same few people now try and do two services. Where are they going to come from? I don't know, maybe God will raise these people up. But we definitely know we want people to be able to come in here and be able to find a seat fairly easily. We don't want impediments. You know? I pray that people come. Man, when I see, see some of you younger people here, today I was like, holy cow, like they're here. Why are they here? I'm glad they're here. I'm glad you guys are here. And then at one moment you guys got up and walked out. I'm like, no, no, I don't want you to walk out. I want you to stay. You know, and then you came back in, and I was like, yeah, they're staying. You may not come back, I don't know, but I hope you do. The, the truth is, we're, we're wanting to grow, even if growth is hard, because growth is hard. And I, I want to share this. This is not the outcome. But what happens when somebody says, perhaps the Lord will save I'm going to step out. This is my big plan. This is, you know, I've prayed about it. God hasn't confirmed or denied it, so I'm going to step out in faith. What if Jonathan and his armor bearer would have been killed? How would we interpret that story? I think we could rightfully say, should have asked God. <laughs> you should have maybe. He did ask God, though, and he got a sign. I told a story once, I'm not going to repeat it, but some of you, I didn't finish telling the story and you didn't like it, and I've only told it like four times, and I'm not going to go into it again, but some of you will remember there was a time in my life where I was taken at gunpoint and marched into a field and told to kneel, and I said goodbye to my wife and my kids because I, I was sure they were going to kill me, right? If 
the guy would have pulled the trigger, it would have gone around the world, is a horrible, devastating, horrible thing. Here's what you never would have known. As I'm walking back there, and I'm recognizing what's going to happen, I, I'm bigger than the guy, I know where the gun is, I was teaching martial arts, I was training six days a week, I was in perfect shape, I knew exactly how to respond, and I was flooded with peace. I felt something I'd never felt before in my life. It was like the most perfect peace ever. And I remember kneeling, and I remember saying goodbye to my wife and kids, and I remember being so excited for what was about to come. For the world, it would have been a tragedy. For my wife and kids, it would have been a tra tragedy. Nobody would have known what God did in that moment. I'm still here, so obviously he didn't pull the trigger. and He left. But the whole reason I got to Ecuador was five families moved there, went to the jungles. Four of the men flew to try and reach this tribe. They made contact. They radioed back to their wives. We've made contact. There's pictures of them. They cooked dinner for, for two or three of the tribe members, took one of the tribe members up in the airplane and said, tomorrow they're taking us to their village, and they were never heard from again. When the soldiers got there with a National Geographic photographer, he took the pictures, they found all five men speared over 30 times, speared to death. Two of the wives, within a year and a half, entered that same village, ended up baptizing the very men that killed their husbands. It was known as a tragedy, but I became a missionary and went to Ecuador because of one of those five men. And I talked to the granddaughter of one of those men, and she said there are literally thousands of missionaries because of the death of those five men. What we think is a failure is not always a failure. So this is what I want to say to you today. You don't have to just be a victim of what life brings you. Some of you are fighting challenges much harder than some others of us. But you don't have to just sit there. You can decide, I'm, I'm going to step out, I'm going to be joyful even though right now I'm having a really hard time with that. I'm going to be faithful to this community, even when I don't feel it. Like, what am I getting? Like, I'm showing up on Sundays, but you know what? I'm going to take advantage. If there's small groups, I'm going to go. I want to plug in. I want to be a part of something. We're talking about a building project. Who knows where that money's going to come from? But we have a dream and a vision. It's not like God told our leaders, build the building, these are the dimensions, this is what it is, and he downloaded it to Natalie and she made it. No, but I think God's in it. And even if he's not, we're stepping out in faith. We're exercising that muscle. I just want to encourage you today. I appreciate what happens, what is happening and, and being able to go to that revival. I didn't feel led then to try to recreate that. But I do think all of us, Alex and Aaron and Phil and Jana and myself, man, we all want people to encounter God. We, we complicate it so much. It doesn't have to be that complicated. So here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a few minutes, and I, I think, um, is it Dan, are you coming up for the closing? Okay, if you'd come on up, I'm just going to ask everybody to stand. And um, and we're going to give you a, a few minutes and um, just want you to think before you, you start to talk to God, what, what is the battle in your heart? right now? What is the battle that you're facing, whether you're facing it well or badly? What is that? And then I want, want you to share that with God. 
And I want you just to say this to God. Talk to him. Whatever words come out are fine. But just say, God, here is a battle that I'm facing. I don't know. I don't know how to face it. But I'm here. Like, I'm here. And I know that you have the power to save. Whether by many or by few. So I'm here. And I'm just asking you over the next, whether it's now or the next few days or week or this year, here is something I cannot do. I I don't know how to resolve it, but I know that you know, and so I'm going to step forward. I'm going to commit. Whatever you bring to my mind, I'm going to share with somebody else, and I'm going to commit. And not commit to solving it myself. I don't know what to do. But I'm, I'm committed to asking you to help. And I don't want to just sit by and watch life pass by while trying to carry this this burden, this battle. Let's go ahead and um, spend some time in prayer. I think we have a closing song as well. So, Dan, maybe it's after the closing song. But um, I'll, I'll start, and then I'll sit down, and then you, you just pray amongst yourselves. God, we come to you today knowing that um, you are here. Your word is filled with promises for us. Right now, if I were to ask somebody to come forward and talk about a mountaintop experience, man, there would be somebody here talking about how great you are. But I also know that for many, if I were to ask for bad testimonies, you know, things in life that aren't going well, things in life that just have us twisted up, there would be many of those desert experiences as well. But this morning, at least in this church, whether we're in the mountains or we're in the desert, we're here proclaiming that you are the God of both. You are the God of the mountains and you are the God of the valleys. Some of us, Father, are where we are because of stupid things that we have done. And we are racked with guilt. And we are ashamed. But we're here. Some of us are in situations that we do not understand. But we are here. Some of us have had our hearts broken. But we are here. So God, if this community comes before you in a few minutes of silent prayer, We declare our together that you are God, that you are our God, that we need you, and that we need you to do what we cannot do for ourselves. And we ask that you you come and that you do what we cannot do. Finally, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. Take a few moments. Think about your struggle. And talk to God.